So let's begin. Uh, we usually start with just a, a very brief prayer. And uh, could I ask John, please, to um, lead us in just a very brief prayer to get started? Sure, let's pray. Uh, Father, we want to commit our time to you now. We thank you that you promised to be with us by your spirit. Uh, we thank you for our fellowship together this evening. Help us to express ourselves clearly and to listen to each other well. Uh, we pray that you'll help us to learn uh, more about one another, but more about you as well through our conversation tonight. And we'd ask this in the name of our Saviour, Jesus. Amen. 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 Lovely. Thank you very much. Uh, well, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're looking forward to a, a very interesting night tonight. So uh, in our sort of weekly Bible study, we've concluded studying the book of James. And in James, particularly, I think it was chapter two, one of the issues that came up um, was the question of faith and works and their role in salvation. Um, and before we dive in, can I please ask everyone to perform a very good work and make sure their microphone is muted uh, and I have faith that you will do that so that we don't sort of uh, get, uh, except, our, uh, except our speakers, of course. We're going to need you to, to speak. Um, yes, so uh, the question is usually posed, and I think it has been a hot topic mostly for the last 500 years. Uh, and the question has been posed as, is it necessary to do any particular things, whether they be good works, acts of charity and kindness and so on in order to be saved, or whether those things actually play very little effective role in our salvation. And really, it's our faith in God that saves us. So to help, or maybe there's a third way of, of thinking about it altogether. Uh, to help us work through these issues, we have a, a lovely lineup of panelists today. Um, so we have, I'll just go in alphabetical order, shall I? Uh, and I'll do it by first name because that's easier. Uh, so we have John McLean with us today, who is the Vice Principal and a Lecturer in Systematic Theology and Ethics at Christ College in Sydney, which is, um, I, I believe, that the main theological college for the Presbyterian Church in, in Sydney? Yeah. Or are there others? It, it's no, the no, one. there's only one. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> Uh, the original and the best. Uh, uh, he focuses in his teaching on theology and ethics of various kinds, and he is also a Presbyterian minister uh, who served in a parish out at Cowan, I believe. Cowra. Is, oh, Cowra. Okay, so yep. I think that's a little closer than Cowra. Out near, out near Bathurst and Orange. Right, which is also a lovely place. Uh, um, he has a, a bachelor's degree in science and a PhD in theology and has published a number of books and academic articles, including a book with the fascinating title of The Real God for the Real World. And we welcome John with us today and thank him very much for giving his Wednesday evening to join us. We also have uh, Robert Haddad, who has worked in education, both at a school and tertiary level, has taught at both those levels for many years, and has uh, also been heavily involved in teaching the teachers, uh, and has uh, been with the Catholic Education Office for the past 10 years doing exactly that, as well as too many other things to mention, I think. <laughs> uh, you can always uh, Google him and find the, the huge number of things that he somehow finds time to do. Uh, and cram into his week. He holds nine university qualifications in areas of law, theology, philosophy, education, religious education, and executive management. Uh, in his PhD thesis, he researched the principles of the new apologetics and applied his findings to create a new apologetics curriculum for Catholic secondary schools. And he has authored 10 books, including books on apologetics, such as Defend the Faith and A Thousand and One Reasons Why It's Great to Be Catholic. And it's really great to have you with us tonight, Robert. Thank you very much for joining us Thank tonight. You. And last but not least, uh, Michael uh, Ibrahim, who is the Director of Teaching and Learning and Lectures in Patristics, the Church Fathers at St. Cyril's. 
uh, Coptic Theological College and lately at St. Andrew's Greek Orthodox Theological College as well. His degrees were in engineering and ancient history, and he's currently completing his PhD on the theology of St. Severus of Antioch. And um, he likes guitars for some reason and making loud noises with guitars. Uh, but they're always beautiful, loud noises. So thank you for joining us today, Michael. Ah, pleasure. <laughs> thank you very much. All righty, so let's dive straight in, shall we? Um, we have a number of questions to kick off some discussion among the panelists, and the format will be I'll pose a question, and then I'll nominate one of our panelists, and we'll hear from him, and then the second and then the third, um, some brief responses, and then we'll just see what kind of discussion uh, arises among them. Uh, that'll be the first half of tonight, roughly the first 40 minutes or so. Uh, at the end of that part of the night, we'll then open up the floor for you guys, the everyone who's joined us today, welcome to everyone, uh, to submit your questions. And uh, what when we come to do that, I'll ask probably the easiest and most organized way to do it is if you can type a question in the chat or even just say, I have a question. And then what I'll do is I can go through in order uh, and we can sort of get your questions and they can be for all three panelists or any one or two of them, depending on the topic, I suppose. But that'll be in the second half. Um, OK, so here is the first question. A really, really simple, easy question to answer. In a nutshell, what does it mean to be saved in your Christian tradition? Um, so I think we might, for this question, we'll just follow the same order as the introductions, and then later on we'll shuffle it up a little bit. So if I can start with you, please, John, what does it mean to be saved? Okay, as you said, a nice, simple, easy question that should be easy to answer in a minute or two. Um, so let me give you a kind of an angle on it. it I'm not, yeah, anyway, we'll see whether this is the kind of thing you're looking for. Uh, so I think first and foremost, I really want to stress salvation is God's work. And so it has to be understood Trinitarianly. It's salvation comes from the Father uh, through the work of the Son. And uh, all that we receive in salvation is achieved by Christ and established in his person and his work and then is applied to us and we receive it through the work of the spirit so that's the it, it always has that trinitarian pattern uh, and then within that pattern uh, one way to think of it would you say there's three it's kind of aspects or dimensions which need to be distinguished but are all inseparably connected with with one another uh, and I guess to be a Reformed Protestant, I'll go with the of, with the with the kind of typical one for us to emphasise first, which is there's a forensic dimension, there's a legal dimension that we're guilty before God and we need to be forgiven and our guilt needs to be dealt with. Uh, there's a so there's one dimension that there's that legal forensic dimension. There's a transformer a transformative dimension that we need to be changed as who we are, as, as sinners who need to be become like Christ and live like him and ref, reflect his character. So we need to be changed. And in our language, we talk about, so the first one, we talk about that as justification. The second, we talk about as sanctification. And then there's a third dimension I think doesn't get talked about enough, which is very much the relational. We need to be brought in to know God as his children. So that would be the blessing of adoption. And it's a filial dimension of becoming God's children. And then all of those are perfected together in, in glory. So there's one way of kind of framing how I think we think about salvation. Beautiful. Thank you very much for that. Uh, Robert, would you like to tell us uh, in the Catholic tradition, what does it mean to be saved? Well, of course, likewise, it's God who saves us and he saves us through Jesus Christ. Um, we like to speak in terms of objective salvation first. Um, that is the redemption of Christ on the cross, by Christ on the cross, which is for all of humanity. Uh, and it's um, by Jesus' death on the cross on our behalf. Now, this is an unmerited grace. 
God gives this freely out of his love and mercy, choosing to uh, take the initial step to restore humanity back into friendship, back into sonship, daughtership with himself after original sin. And he does that uh, solely through the, the infinite, infinite merits of Jesus Christ on the cross. Now, that's the objective salvation. And I think St. Paul refers to that, that. He means to refer to that in Ephesians 2 when he says, for grace you have been saved. That The grace is God giving Jesus Christ to die on, the, die on the cross for the whole of humanity. Then there's our, our response to that. Uh, so there's we're, we are objectively saved in the past tense by what Christ did 2,000 years ago. And we also are being saved in the present, um, working out our salvation with fear and trembling, as St. Paul says in Philippians 2, 12. So we are working with God's grace uh, to, to, of course, faith is what is initial. We believe in God. We believe in Jesus Christ as the Son of God who died on the cross, rose again, ascended into heaven, now seated at the right hand of the Father. And in obedience to Christ's teachings, we are corresponding with his daily grace, what we call, what St. Augustine called prevenient grace, to, and working out our salvation and fear and trembling to be faithful every day, one day at a time to Christ's teachings. And then we talk about salvation in the future tense. He who endures to the end will be saved, as Jesus said in Matthew 10, 22. So we are, we will, Ultimate salvation, final salvation, is when we uh, we die, we're judged by Jesus Christ, one-on-one, uh, -on -one personally by him. And if we are found to be worthy uh, and we enter into eternal glory, uh, that is final salvation. We are saved in the in the absolute sense. Uh, and, and, and that's what, what is our eternal destiny uh, in God, face-to-face, -face, all through the work of Jesus Christ and corresponding with his grace. Beautiful. Thank you very much for that. And Michael, if you could give us an orthodox uh, perspective. Uh, probably not, but um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll uh, do my best. I've just realised I've come uh, extremely un underprepared for this uh, uh, discussion. I, I, was, I was intimidated by the lineup anyway, but now I'm uh, definitely intimidated. Um, yeah, look, I mean, I think uh, there are really beautiful aspects of, of what has been said uh, by by uh, our, our two distinguished uh, guests. Um, I think uh, one thing I would also add to that, certainly, and I'm not saying that that, that has been missed out on purpose, but uh, just another dimension to it as well, which is really about, um, you know, on, on the basis of our, uh, the, the redemptive uh, uh, work of the cross and, and uh, obviously our Lord Jesus Christ's uh, resurrection and ascension into heaven, which then paves the way for us to live that life of, of uh, communion with God, is, uh, I guess, something I would call like uh, like the communal dimension as well. So that part of this process of salvation, uh, really from an Orthodox perspective, is also to find our own right and fitting place within God's uh, creation, within God's plan. Uh, so that often involves then uh, our connectedness not only here, but also our connectedness with uh, with the, the uh, uh, heavenly realm as well. And it's, it's, uh, it's, it's I guess, uh, that makes it really a ongoing process. And certainly a lot of the patristic witness would argue that, uh, you know, being saved is an ongoing process. Um, and even in the heavenly life, it is a, uh, a life of uh, motion from glory to glory as well. So uh, does that constitute also part of the process of salvation? I'll uh, leave that as a little bit of uh, theologumina. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. That's a pious opinion for those who don't speak Greek. <laughs> uh, Thank you for that, gents. Uh, so can, can I just ask a follow-up question uh, to this? I, I want to turn shortly to our role as human beings in that process of salvation, but um, what Michael said just raised another question for me, which is the role of God in salvation, the role of Christ, let's say specifically. Do you hold that Jesus saved us on the cross only, or is it the whole life of Christ, the incarnation, you know, the ascension, the teaching, the miracles, and so on? 
where does the salvation actually like i don't yeah how does the salvation happen does it just happen on the cross or does it happen across his whole life um who would like to sort of jump in on that one I think we're going to hear from the three of you anyway. Shall we just go in reverse order? I'll, I'll risk I'll going go, Robert. first. Yep, go for it. Yeah. From the Catholics, Catholics use this term Paschal mystery, the Passover mystery, the Passover of Christ. And so strictly speaking, of course, the cross of Christ is the core of it. But this event, the Passover mystery event of Christ, begins with the Last Supper, progresses to uh, the Garden of Gethsemane, goes through his arrest and trial, condemnation, then crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, 40 days, uh, post-resurrection, and his ascension into heaven. That's the whole Paschal mystery that saves us. So, for example, uh, if Christ died on the cross, was buried and didn't rise from the dead, then no one would be believing in him today. So it was essential uh, for Christ's credibility and or credentials to be the Savior, the Messiah, that he had to rise from the dead as well. So we look at that whole, the, all those series of individual events is really one whole mis mystery of redemption, the work of Christ. Okay, so not the incarnation then, just those events around the crucifixion? Well, if there was no incarnation, we wouldn't have had, we wouldn't have the Paschal mystery because the incarnation, God becoming man or human, um, he's joining the human family, the family of Adam, and he's, he's ultimately going to be offering a free sacrifice to God the Father on behalf of the human family. So the incarnation is essential, and the incarnation is essential also to give value infinitely meritorious value to Christ's death on the cross because if he was only a creature that Christ's merits wouldn't be infinite and wouldn't be sufficient to to redeem all all sin or humanity from all sin so the incarnation is essential um, for God to become man so that the sacrifice is offered on behalf of humanity and the sacrifice is of infinite merit right um uh, the other two gents, anyone would like to go next? Sure, let me um, add, add a couple of other things. Uh, I mean, I really like the way Robert in his first comment, you know, talked about the objective and the subjective, which would be almost exactly the way we'd, uh, I'd want to think about things as well. That is what Christ has achieved. I, I think I'd want to say that the whole of the life and work of Christ from the incarnation through to the ascension contributes to the achievement of salvation. Um, I, I've got quite a few friends in my circles who'd probably say more like what Robert said, that the incarnation, you know, is the necessary precondition for the work of Christ and for the value of the work of Christ. But I'm at least inclined to say that the incar even in the incarnation, you know, the kind of Athanasian theme of he becomes what we are in order that we might become what he is, that even in the incarnation itself, is the beginning of the healing of human nature. Um, but that ultimately it takes the whole of Christ's work and you can never isolate a single moment in the life of Christ, although the cross is central in that narrative, but the cross without the resurrection means nothing. Um, obviously the resurrection without the cross is not, doesn't happen. Um, so I think uh, at the end of Romans 4, Paul says, Christ died for our sins and was raised again for our justification. Um, so that the Christ bearing the punishment that we deserve in the cross has to be matched with God's verdict of, um, of, of declaring Christ righteous in the resurrection. Um, and I think you can, again, trace that sort of pattern across uh, several of the different themes of salvation. So I want to say the whole of Christ's life from incarnation to his ascension is the, is the objective achievement of salvation, which is then applied to us in the work of the Spirit. Great. 
thanks for that. Uh, Michael, would you like to weigh in on this? Yeah, um, oh, look, I mean, I think uh, from an orthodox uh, perspective, uh, you know, the, the, the cross sits at the central, uh, at the center of, 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 of our faith, uh, both in terms of um, the life of our Lord Jesus Christ and also within our own personal lives as well, uh, that we uh, individually and collectively as communities are, are called to, to carry our cross. Um, one uh, thing I would say is that it, from an orthodox perspective, certainly my understanding of it, that there is a um, much. Uh, it's it's not just about the cross. It is his um, birth sanctifies birth. His baptism is the reason we can be baptized, and is the reason that our baptism has efficacy. Uh, his defeat of death is the the reason that we can then uh, also defeat death. Uh, and his bodily ascension into heaven is the reason that we, with our uh, glorified bodies, can also ascend into heaven uh, and, and become partakers. So it's it's not just a, a um, it would be viewed uh, quite um, holistically in terms of everything that our Lord Jesus Christ was and everything that he did. But I would actually even say that even beyond that, I mean, you could argue that that the work of salvation, in fact, happens from the very beginning of creation itself. Uh, in in that uh, uh, Christ is, or, or the, the Logos is the um, is the agent of, of creation with the Father and the Spirit, um, and that uh, from the very beginning, uh, the uh, the seeds of that uh, uh, salvation that has been wrought in Christ is there from the very beginning. The imagery of the tree, the imagery of the um, you know the, the the you know even down to the you know some church fathers the the, the progenitive. Uh, capacity of the human person is already a um, uh, a symbol of the coming salvation in Christ through His birth. Um, things like even you know the, the symbolism of of, uh, of uh, Adam and Eve as Christ and the Church, uh, you know, and and you know, and then the, you know, the husband, the man leaves his father and mother and is joined to his wife, is something which is completely uh, uh, historically inaccurate. In terms of the way that uh, the world of late antiquity worked, uh, so you know the the, the father, I beg your pardon, uh, the the, uh, the the son leaving his father's house in order to be wedded to his bride is is a christological image to do with uh, Christ's incarnation and the creation of the church and all that sort of stuff. So it's yeah, I, I would take a, a much a, a very broad view of that, but certainly at the centre of it is uh, the defeat of death on the cross. Uh, uh, and uh, the sanctification of our own death in Christ's death. Okay, lovely. Thank you. So um, this allows us now to turn to the human role in salvation. And Michael, you, you mentioned there that the things that Jesus did as a human being incarnate in, in, on the earth sanctified the things that we now are able to do. So this brings us to this question of faith and works. So do we need to do those things in order to participate in the salvation that Christ uh, offers to us? Uh, and you mentioned even things like baptism and so on. So uh, could you maybe just give us an idea then of the orthodox view on, um, let's, just, let's just focus on the sacraments first, and then we'll come to sort of, you know, the doing good works and more generally afterwards. So um, do we need to receive the sacraments in order to participate in that salvation? And we'll start with you, Michael, since you brought it up. Yeah, um, the, I'll, I'll take a bit of a, a cop-out response to that and say uh, uh, certainly from an Orthodox perspective, we have to uh, remain uh, faithful to, to what has been handed on to us and certainly the sacramental aspect of, of our life. Uh, is is very significant from an ecclesial perspective. Um, I am personally reluctant to uh, condemn uh, anyone outside of that sacramental life because uh, that's I, I view that as as God's business. Uh, but ha having having said that, uh, God has called us towards that sacramental life, and of course, we need to think of sacrament as being much more broadly defined than than simply the seven sacraments of the church according to, to, to Roman Catholic uh, theology, or, you know, we also use that terminology from an orthodox perspective. 
Uh, certainly those sacramental acts are, are a high point of that uh, of, of that touching between the divine and the human. Um, uh, but it is ultimately um, uh, an experience that happens within Christ. And uh, Christ, the whole of, 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 of uh, creation is mystically contained within him as well. So uh, which part of creation uh, uh, is in the good books and which is in the bad books? That's God's business. <laughs> it's all his, it's not mine. Okay, well, uh, I, I'm going to go to John next because I think um, he may. Uh, this may be where we get some different opinions on things. Yeah, it may be. Um, or we've had a fair bit of agreement so far. Uh, so first of all, I guess we've got to say in the Reformed tradition, only two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. So there's one difference. Uh, we talk about the sacraments being signs and seals of redemption in Christ. And so they point us to the reality of salvation in Christ. That's their signification. And they're sealing, and they're, as seals, they bring home to us and mark home to us the reality of, uh, of the salvation we have in Christ. Um, but in the Reformed tradition, we'd probably highlight, we'd, we'd see the sacraments always work in, uh, through the work of the Spirit, with the Word of God, the Word of the Gospel explaining them and applying them and then the gift of the spirit bringing about faith in the recipient and you need those you need the word and the work of the spirit and then the response of faith in order that the sacraments are effective in in bringing a blessing being a means of grace uh, so all of that means if you do have the word and genuine faith in the message of jesus that's what the sacraments point to and so while I, the Reformed tradition is, well, I shouldn't say has never, in its best moments, always remain, always continues to insist the sacraments are important and they're part of God's blessing uh, and the ordinary Christian life will begin with baptism and will continue with regularly taking the Lord's Supper. But if you were unable to do that, that, wouldn't, that doesn't cut you out of salvation. Salvation is hearing God's word and responding to it. Um, and the sacraments are signs and seals of that. So that won't be as central to a reformed understanding of salvation as they would be in the, the orthodoxy that Michael described. Great. Uh, before I move to Robert, can I just ask for a little clarification uh, from you, John? Uh, you use the terms signs and seals. I wonder if you could just elaborate what you mean by those terms a little more um, key, uh, and, and, you know, are they different to what, say, the Catholic or the Orthodox uh, would think of when we think of a sacrament like uh, the body and blood of Christ? Sure. I mean, we're going to differ on the presence of Christ in and through the sacraments. Um, although perhaps not as, as a Calvinist, perhaps not as much as you might expect we're going to. Uh, but I would want to say that the the body and blood of Christ are present in heaven, not in and not in the sacraments, but as signs, God by his spirit directs us to the, the body and blood of the risen Christ and the risen Christ himself um, and effectively spiritually brings us into communion with him through the signs. Um, right. But there's not, but, but it's not in, the sacraments are working as signs. So that's why that's why in our tradition we would talk about them as being signs. Uh, but especially the language of seals is to talk about the real subjective experience. Um, it's not just a matter of remembering Christ, uh, but actually being brought into communion with him in the means that he's provided. So just as, as we hear his word read and preached, Christ is present to us by his word. So by his spirit and word, with the sacraments, he's present to us. Right. And so that, we're brought into experience of communion with him. So the, the Holy Spirit is certainly working in a sacrament with in, in the people partaking of it. But 
if it came to say this actually is the real presence of Christ, the bodily presence, that's where you would probably say no. It's just sort right. of a connection to the real Christ. Right. Would, would so, that be fair to say? Yes. Um, yes. So, you know, famously, lots of Presbyterian churches have on their communion table uh, the words from the uh, Sunday, from the Easter morning service, he is not here, he is risen. Right. And that's actually polemical <laughs> in a way. You know, it's saying, unlike the Catholic tradition, which I guess we're particularly differentiating ourselves from because we're part of the Western tradition, we don't think that that it, that in some bodily sense Christ is present on the table. Yeah. Um, but that we should look to heaven, but that the signs are effective in directing us sure. to our to our communion in heaven great well speaking of that catholic tradition from which you've differentiated <laughs> robert um what role do the sacraments play in the human um side of salvation well with together with the orthodox the catholic church asserts there are seven ritual sacraments given to us by christ and um, we can point to various passages in the New Testament that give material support for that. Of the seven, uh, we believe that Christ mandated two, uh, baptism and, and the Eucharist. And uh, when, for example, when he commands in Matthew, we read in Matthew 28, go baptize all nations, that's Christ mandating to his church that all peoples must be brought to him uh, and sealed with baptism in the name of the Father and Son of the Holy Spirit. And then we have the Eucharist, of course, um, Christ spoke about, you know, when we read in John 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you shall have no life in you. And there, there are other passages in John 6 as well. So we believe those are two necessary sacraments that ought to be received under obedience when we are aware of Christ's command. Now, God binds himself by this. There's a maxim, a, a classical Catholic maxim here. God binds himself by the sacraments to bestow the grace, but he's not bound by the sacraments, meaning he's not limited. So as I think John or Michael said, if you're unaware of the sacraments, you can still have a relationship with God and God is still in, the, in his love and mercy giving sufficient grace to all to be saved. So God works through the sacraments to give us the grace merited through Christ's passion on the cross, death on the cross. But he can also work outside of the sacraments. So um, now we, we must never look at the sacraments as a necessary work. They are means through which God, through Christ, bestows upon us the grace merited by Christ on the cross, so we can walk the journey of faith. And when we look at the sacraments, there's a wisdom there, spiritual birth and baptism, spiritual adulthood and strengthening and confirmation, food for the spiritual journey in the Eucharist. When we have a, we have a pit stop, if we're going to have a car crash in our spiritual journey, which is a sacrament of penance or reconciliation, and then we have the social sacraments, holy matrimony, the perpetuation of the church naturally, and holy orders for the perpetuation of Christ's ministerial priesthood that serves the church. And then we have anointing of the sick at the end of, of, of the spectrum of life. And these are aids to salvation, as well as the first two sacraments I mentioned as necessary for salvation under obedience. Uh, it's not a case that I have to uh, receive this sacrament as a work to be back to be saved, but I morally ought to receive the sacrament because it's through the sacraments that I receive the necessary grace to walk in faith because I can't do it by my own strength. I will fall because we're all weak, we're all sinners, we're all prone to sin. So that's the general picture with regard to the sacraments. I won't go any deeper about individual sacraments because I don't think the time permits that. But No, that's great. Can I just ask for a quick clarification, though? Um, my understanding is I've often heard it in the Coptic Church that it's the first four of the sacraments that are required for every believer, including confirmation um, and confession or repentance. So that's well, that's not the case in the Catholic Church? I would say that confirmation is morally required, not absolutely required. Now, I know that from my own personal life experience, I was confirmed as an adult um, when I was 22. And 
uh, that's after I had a, a greater conversion uh, to Christ in the Catholic tradition. And I know, well, I feel subjectively that that, had, that spiritually strengthened me uh, and to walk the journey of faith. So I would say the Catholic position is that confirmation is morally necessary, not absolutely necessary. As for penance, well, we can always approach God directly and ask for him to forgive our sins. And I, in my teaching, I encourage people to do that every day. But we believe that the first thing Jesus did after he rose from the dead, which we read in John 20, 21 to 23, said he, he, he breathed on the Holy, he breathed the Holy Spirit upon the 10 disciples in the upper room. St. Thomas wasn't there and Judas had committed suicide. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. Whose sins you shall forgive, they are forgiven. And whose sins you shall hold, they are held fast. So there was a power and authority given to the church because the essential mission of the church is to perpetuate what Christ was doing on earth, to, to teach, to govern, to sanctify. And, and Christ forgave sins as head and Christ, his body, the church, likewise will forgive sins visibly in the world. So we have to ask ourselves the question, if, if Christ gave us this great gift of the sacrament of reconciliation, as we call it today, Okay, or penance more formally, then it ought to be accessed, it ought to be used. And the history of the church testifies that it was used. The way it was administered over the centuries has changed and can change because the church has an authority to, to, to regulate how it's administered, but the core of it remains always the same. Uh, so, you know, <clears throat> if it's there to be used, if it's given as, the, as a gift, well, we should frequent it. And that's why the Catholic Church has a law it's an ecclesiastical law uh, um, going back to the 13th century, early 13th century, that Christians ought to receive this sacrament minimum once a year around Easter time, thereabouts. Uh, and that's a, a positive ecclesiastical law of the church, which can be changed, but it hasn't been changed for 807 years at the moment. So. <laughs> that's very specific. <laughs> okay, uh, let, let's move on to the, uh, the, the next sort of part, which is... Uh, Okay, so let me be the devil's advocate here, okay? Christ came and did his part to save us and ask people to believe in him. Is it not enough for me to simply believe in him? Does that not then put me on his side, so to speak? <laughs> Whatever I happen to do after that, if I, you know, if I live the life of a saint or if I make a lot of mistakes, um, is that really going to change anything? Or isn't it enough to just have believed? Because it seems that James in his letter, were, uh, I, I, you know, was possibly disagreeing with St. Paul in some way. So, Robert, since we have you at the moment, shall we go to you first, if you can give us your views on that? I've always believed that faith in Christ, to believe in Christ, is to believe in what he did, who he is and what he did. The, the, he is the word of God made flesh, the son of God. He he he. He died on the cross, rose again from the dead, ascended into heaven, is alive now at the right hand of the Father. That's faith. That's Christian faith. That's faith in Jesus Christ as the Son of God. But for me, in the Catholic tradition, to believe in Christ, to have faith in Christ, is also to believe in everything he's revealed, all his teachings. And flowing from that comes obedience to his teachings. So... For me, once you're aware, now we're all judged by, we believe we're judged by Christ according to our conscience. So it's about awareness. If I'm aware that Jesus commanded baptism, then I ought to receive it. And all con converts in the Acts of the Apostles are, are baptized without exception. If I believe that Christ said, uh, do this in memory of me, then the church ought to do that in obedience to Christ's command and for us to receive the gift of the Eucharist. If Jesus commands in Matthew 19, 17, if you wish to enter into life, keep the commandments, then we ought to keep the commandments. If Jesus taught, as St. Paul did, you know, that the commandments are now summarized as laws of love, love God with all your mind, body, heart, and soul, as we read in Mark 10 and, and Luke and Luke, um, with respect to the, the young lawyer, the lawyer and the and the rich young man, you must love God with all your mind, body, heart, and soul, and your neighbor as yourself. Okay, then that's faith in action. That's faith living itself out in love, and that's what Paul says in Galatians five six. It's it is a faith that works itself out in love. It's neither circumcision nor uncircumcision that counts, but a faith that works itself out in love. And I always so, look at the, 
Yes. Rob, Rob, sorry, if I can jump in. So, okay, let's say I believe in God, I believe in Christ, and I follow most of the commandments, but not all of them, right? There's a few that I find a bit hard and I'm not terribly convinced about them. Am I still saved, so well, to speak? St. James, in, in his epistle, I, I don't know the exact reference, but I have a vague recollection of it, that he does warn that we can't have, we can't be eclectic about the commandments. I can't be a a liar i can't i can't say listen i i don't commit adultery but i'm a thief but i'm paraphrasing i think john you recognize the quote i'm referring yeah, to james there. too isn't it yeah yeah i mean look i'm not i'm like the rest of us i'm not going to make judgments on anyone's eternal destiny but i wouldn't want to be that type of christian who picks and who's you know cafeteria type christian who picks and chooses chooses what when i know what christ commands to then make a judgment myself and say look thou shalt not commit adultery like that's a bit too hard for me it's, i know it's a 21st century i want to go with the flow but if i'm weak and i commit adultery that's not the eternal the end of me i'm still alive god still loves me god still wishes me to be saved god's still giving me grace to repent of that sin and to commit not to do it again and to die in his grace uh, but if I'm, an adv if I'm an advocate for adultery and I'm out there saying, look, it doesn't matter, you know, Christ was, you got to place him in the context of the first century, rigorism, all that, you know, we're in the 21st century now, that law is now obsolete, go ahead and commit adultery. Well, I don't think you can really get away with that. You can't really call yourself a Christian of, 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 of in my opinion, in good faith with, or, with integrity. If you know Christ's teachings and you deliberately, consciously reject them. So, John, what do you think about this? And, and if I, before you answer, can I, um, can I just tell you, I, I mean, I have occasionally heard a kind of a stick figure caricature of Protestant thought that, um, you know, if once you say, I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, therefore that's it you're saved and whatever happens in your life whatever you do after that it's not really going to change that um, is that a fair uh, sort of depiction of what you believe i'm guessing it's not but i don't know I, well, well, you, you tell us what do you think <laughs> yeah i mean it's not a, i don't think it's a fair character it's not a fair picture of what i believe um and and again i don't think it's a picture of what certainly the reform tradition has held Although there probably are versions of Protestantism which come close to saying that or sound like they're saying that at times. Uh, and, you know, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, famous Lutheran figure, was a martyr in World War II, um, you know, warned about easy believism, which is that kind of idea of just, yeah, I say I believe and that, that's, all, that's all I need to worry about. Mm. Um, and there's lots, I mean, almost everything Robert said I'd want to agree with so let me try and say it in a way that I think picks out the, some of the differences, or at least where I think the differences might be from my side. Um, so the reform tradition has distinguished between the forensic element of justification, the transformatory element of, of sanctification and the filial dimension of adoption and distinguished between those without dividing them apart, but saying they are distinguishable. I might and, get you to just be, I mean, some of us may not be familiar with those very technical terms. Could you maybe sure. put it in simpler language, those three dimensions for us? Yeah, yeah. So justification or forensic is about guilt and acquittal. Are you guilty? Are you acquitted? <clears throat> are you forgiven, we could say? Um, sanctification is often used in the reform tradition to talk about God changing us, making us more wholly changing our character, draw, making our character more and more like Christ. And then adoption, um, you know, that, that we know God as his, being his children, that we enjoy fellowship with God. Um, so we want to say that justification is established at the beginning of the Christian life, that the, life, that the death and, and resurrection of Christ has borne the penalty that we deserve to pay so that when we put our trust in in christ 
we are acquitted, we are justified, we have a status before God as accepted, um, declared not guilty. Uh, uh, There's something else I was going to say from that. Anyway, can't remember what it was. So, but that that's not the whole package of salvation. And so, those who genuinely put their faith in Christ and can be confident from the very beginning that they're that they are accepted and welcomed by God are then changed by him as well. And, and that that flows out of faith and, and accompanies faith. So one of the famous lines that it came from Luther, first of all, but it's actually in our Presbyterian Westminster Confession. We're saved, we're justified by faith alone, but the faith that justifies is never alone, you know, but it's accompanied by all un, other graces. Including so there is a difference works. there, I think, by by saying justification is established at the beginning of the Christian life and provides a foundation upon which uh, the rest of the Christian life is lived. Um, but then, I mean, then what I'm going to say is very similar to what Robert said. The person who's justified has to, in their relationship with God, continually seek to live for him and seek his grace that they might grow. They have to come to him and continue to ask for forgiveness. And if they were living a life which totally rejected, that they claim they've taken Jesus as Lord and Saviour, but they're actually not living like that at all. And, you know, even, you know, to take Robert's example, actually promoting disobedience, uh, that really raises the question for everybody else. And it should raise the question for them whether their faith is even genuine. Mm. But what, what if they feel that that is sort of the, like, they may have misunderstood, right? But they, they're still very sincere in their faith. What, what you know, how would you understand that sort of situation? Well, I mean, sincerity in the end is not the test of truth. Right. Um, and, and so to say, you know, I mean, as other people said tonight, I mean, we don't want to be too, we, we, we want to be very cautious about judging where other people stand spiritually. Um, and, and God certainly is merciful and will judge people according to what they've had the opportunity to learn and hear. But the person who has had the opportunity and has the capacity to have understood what the, the gospel message is, um, and especially the person who claims to follow Jesus but actually ignores him in their life, uh, you know, the Bible's got really strong words of warning against hypocrisy. And I guess hypocrites can still have a sort of sincerity about them. <laughs> they probably do, I think, yes. <laughs> um, okay, uh, look, just one other very quick uh, question out of my ignorance, I suppose. <laughs> so I apologise if this is a silly question. But I was just interested when you said that the justification occurs at the beginning of that journey to Christ and then is the foundation for the rest of the journey. Yeah. If we're thinking in legal terms, if I was, um, you know, exonerated or, or, you know, found innocent in a court case for something that I've done wrong, but I then went out and did something else wrong, committed a new crime, surely that first justification wouldn't apply to the second crime, if you see what I'm saying. So uh, is, is that, I mean, how you know, in what sense is that justification a foundation? Does it continue? Is it kind of, it never expires in some way? It continues to apply even if I sin? Or does it have to be somehow renewed every time I sin? No, so I want to say the first, that is, God justify it's, it's me as a sinner who, in the totality of who I am, needs to be justified. And has been in the work of Christ objectively. And as I receive that, I am a forgiven, acquitted, accepted uh, person. And that my walk of obedience doesn't in itself change that. Now, but um, that's why it's important to remember there's at least three kind of dimensions to salvation. And the filial relational dimension certainly requires us to continue to be aware of our 
sinfulness and that our consistent and persistent sins will interrupt our fellowship with God and we need to bring those to God and ask for his forgiveness. So there's a there's that continued relational dimension as well, as well as the transformative that God will be working in us to change us and we need to receive that and and, and cooperate with him in that put to death sin, put on Christ. Right. And in the sense that I am a child of God, um, therefore I am kind of a good person in a sense that I've been justified, I've, I've been found innocent because I'm a child of God kind of thing. Right. And and so yeah. Luther talked famously, and and again, I think we can we'll accept this in the reform tradition to some extent, that we can rightly talk of an alien righteousness imputed to us. Right. So it's what God, what God has done in Christ outside of us which is counted to us, that is the basis of our justification or that right. is our justification. But then I just want to keep on saying, but the faith that justifies is never alone. So as we receive that right, that alien righteousness um, on the basis of Christ's death and resurrection, we also are called to be transformed and God will be transforming us right. as well alongside that. Thanks for that. Yeah, that's that's really helpful. Thank you for that. Um, Michael, what do you think? Is 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 all of that sort of similar to how you would express this question of, you know, is there a need for living a good life and so on? Is there a patristic view on this? Yeah, well, well, well look, I mean, I think uh, broadly speaking, I think that there's a kind of general agreement uh, on this in the sense that, um, you know, you're, you're absolutely right, uh, Father Antonius, you know, there's uh, we often draw caricatures, which are highly inaccurate about uh, about other people's positions. I think there's just a, a few uh, little points that I'd like to make from an orthodox perspective. Um, I mean that that, that um, uh, sorry, John, I forgot forgot the, the term that you used. An alien um, alien righteousness. Alien righteousness. Yep. Yeah. So in, in other words, it's a righteousness which doesn't belong to us by virtue of just us being us. It's something right. that, it's that, not that's God given. To us. It's yeah, not yeah, imparted yeah. to us. Yeah. Um, one of the interesting things, see, we're kind of starting to touch on, on the issue of, of, of grace here, I guess. Um, and um, uh, certainly in, in some schools of thought within orthodoxy, you know, um, uh, that alien, um, uh, <clears throat> you know, that, that, that aspect of, 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 of say, grace is, uh, goes all the way back to the beginning of creation itself so the very fact that we have being from non-being is from the get-go a sign of that divine uh, action where it's not warranted and and and, and not deserved um, so uh, in other words there's kind of a a, a broader picture of, of, of that particular idea but certainly there are uh, you know in want of a better expression in those uh, kind of sacred sacramental uh, ways, uh, you know, part of that is, is what you would refer to as justification. Um, uh, you know, that, that uh, that's um, very unique uh, expressions of that grace that God has towards his creation. I think that's, that's, uh, that's uh, one thing. The other thing I, I, is that from my understanding, at least, and I'm, I'm probably wrong on this, I'm wrong on lots of things. You just only need to ask my wife. Um, uh, the um, uh, you know this 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 idea of looking at things, I guess, in in steps. Uh, you know, within the Orthodox tradition, we also have these uh, this idea of steps and levels. So, for example, you know, thinking of the monastic tradition, you know, there's uh, the idea of uh, you know this goes all the way back to Evagoras and Pontus. Yeah, um, you know, the the idea of, of repentance as the first step, and then once you've repented, you then contemplate. And then once you contemplate, you are illuminated. Uh, so it's interesting that there's also that tripartite uh, level. But the thing that's interesting is that um, that's not viewed necessarily as a temporal progression. It's really a case of we are constantly engaged in those acts. And there's a really beautiful account of, um, of the death of, of, of a, a desert father from Egypt, uh, whose name is Shishoi, not to be mixed up with Bishoi for any of the, the cops here. Uh, and uh, th there's a, um, a beautiful account of, of him in his monastery surrounded by his monks as he's on his deathbed. And he says to them, um, 
uh, they say to him, you know, Father, what can you see? And he says, oh, I can see the saints. The saints are in the room. And then a little bit later, they say, what can you see? And they say, oh, the, he says, the apostles are here. They, 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 they've come. And then a little bit later, you know, what, what's going on? He said, oh, the angels are here and they've come to take my soul. And uh, he said, and then his um, uh, disciples say to him, and what are you asking? What are you saying to them? And he says to them, I'm begging for a little bit more time so that I can begin to repent. <laughs> um, you know, so, so uh, I guess from an orthodox perspective, uh, whilst there is a recognition of that journey that we go on, there's also a sense of an atemporal dimension to that, you know, which makes it not a journey, but rather aspects that need to be embraced as a, as, as a whole. Um, and that would include everything from the most basic foundational repentance to that experience of, of, of communion with God, that illumination as well. Um, and in terms of uh, faith and works as well, I just wanted to say something very quickly. I think, you know, often uh, that the whole beat up uh, of, of this fight between faith and works uh, really comes out of a uh, decontextualization of what St. Paul uh, says and what, what, what the epistle James says, you know. So St. Paul's very particular when he's critical of works. You know, he's not saying that you, know, you don't do good works. In fact, if you look very carefully through St. Paul, he's often uh, exhorting people to make sure that they continue in their good works. Now, what he's referring to, of course, uh, just for clarity's sake, is this idea that by following the law, and, and he's often speaking about specifically the Jewish law, that simply following the Jewish law is enough to uh, for salvation. That's a very different context, I think, to, to what's happening in James. So, so in, in, in the epistle of St. James, it's really about the fact that, um, you know, we don't compartmentalize ourselves into theory and practice, that, that for faith to be truly faithful, it must transform our whole being. And that then is shown through our, our lives and our works and, and, and everything. So, uh, you know, kind of this uh, divide between faith and works, uh, I suspect is kind of a, uh, a slightly, uh, I don't know, this is, a, this is a, a, anachronistic, but uh, uh, slightly Cartesian, uh, where, where the scriptures themselves don't uh, call for that. Yeah, so can, can I, yeah. So in terms of what, that last thing that you've said, Michael, um, that that uh, it's the salvation is about being transformed, uh, which kind of takes us beyond categories of, you know, what I believe in my mind or in my heart, what I do with my actions. It's more about what I am, the kind of person that I am. Could you just elaborate for a minute or so just on, on what that means? Uh yeah, I, I, I can certainly try, Father. I think, um, uh, you know, the, the, the idea the idea really, well, I, I like to think of it in terms of kind of theory and practice, uh, just to, to, so that I can wrap my, my small mind around uh, the, the, uh, uh, the, the concept. You know, uh, the, the theory, well, actually, let me take a step back. Uh, I, I think that faith is foundational. So in other words, faith is the umbrella under which uh, works then fit. But in order for faith to be real, then it must be actualized. And the thing that's interesting as well is if you look at the Greek word pistis, it, it's not simply the idea of faith. It's also about the, the concept of being faithful. So that there's also that, that dimension to it as well. So it's not simply about believing something, but it is about responding to that belief in a particular way. And that's how faithfulness is experienced. Um, yeah, so, so I think that part of the issue as well is, is uh, you know, the, the nuances of, of the Greek, which are lost uh, when we uh, go to English. Everything comes back to the Greek. <laughs> oh, nice, those Greeks. Uh, thanks for that, Michael. Um, okay, look, uh, this is a good opportunity to ask uh, everyone else if you'd like to ask any questions of our panellists. So please do uh, either type in your question in the chat or... Uh, if you like, just say, I have a question, type that in the chat as well. And what I'll try to do is sort of take you in the order that you type. Um, so please go ahead. If you have a question, type it in now uh, and, and we'll do that. And while we're waiting for you to think of your questions, I'll, I'll pose one last one uh, for our panelists from me. Uh, the question of free will. Uh, do we have free will? 
uh, are there, uh, is that an important part of our salvation that we choose to to have to want to be saved and to want to follow Christ? Um, and um, you, you know, I'm going to start with you, John, on this one. <laughs> uh, I also want to ask: are, are, are there people who sort of that's not an option for them? God didn't create them for that. Because again, that's one of those sort of standard things that are said about certain trends in Protestant thought. You know, there are some uh, vessels for destruction. You know, God made them to be so from the beginning and, and that, you know, they really can't be saved. Is that the case or, you know, is that a caricature as well? Could you maybe enlighten us on, on how you think about the, that question of free will? So that's to me, is it, that question? John, yes, sorry. Yeah, yes. I, I just, my internet struggled for a moment there. I wasn't, I didn't hear it all, but I think I heard what you were asking. Um, yeah, so I do believe in the doctrine of election that humans, uh, and, and it's got to do with grace, that humans are dead in sin and our response to God comes not from our capacity to respond, but from his grace, uh, his readiness to change, change us. And that when he does change us, uh, we will change. There's an irresistibility about that. The Bible says almost nothing about uh, election to condemnation or reprobation is what it's technically the technical term. And, and so the, the biblical emphasis is all about God's merciful election um, to bring people to himself. Uh, but that does mean there are some who aren't chosen, that Romans 9 talks about God passing by some. Right. And, and I mean, is there any sort of um, thought on uh, sort of why they would be passed? Or is this sort of just one of the mysteries of, of the mind of God that we'll never understand? Absolutely. That's the answer. Right. So you don't look at yourself and think, oh, well, I know why God chose me. Uh, you know, because if it was me, I definitely would have chosen myself. I'm so impressive. It's right. not, you know, if anything, uh, you know, God tells Israel, I chose you because you were weak and sinful. Uh, you know, Paul says, God saved me because I was the chief of sinners. Uh, but I don't think that's a total explanation for why God chooses. It is the mystery of God's will. Um and we don't know who is or isn't chosen. That's not our task to discern that. Um, our task is to love our neighbours and especially to love our neighbours by telling them about Jesus and the genuine offer of hearing about all that God has done in Christ and responding to him in faith. That offer is genuinely given to everybody and we're responsible to take that to everybody. Okay. Uh, we may not know whether others are part of the elect or not, but would the believer know he himself is elect or not? Right, in the sense that when we come to faith, faith is the gift that God gives to those who are elect. Right. And, of course, you get, I mean, you can certainly tangle yourself up in spiritual worries about is my faith real faith? And, and you know, there an emphasis on an election can produce that in the reform tradition. Uh, and people have thought about that a lot. Uh, so John Calvin um, has this lovely saying, he says, Christ is the mirror of election. So if you want to know about whether we are elect or not, we don't try and get behind Christ and sort of try and get into God's book of life and read through it and see if my name's in there. Uh, God offers his redemption to us in Christ. And as we hear Christ calling us and respond, that's the pro that's the evidence and and the and the um reassurance great thanks for that um uh, michael or robert would you like to sort of say anything on that before I, i've noticed we've got a couple of questions that have come in but before we go to them yeah tony I was, um the catholic position um is that there's one predestination uh we look at St. Paul, 1 Timothy 2, 4, where it says, God wills all to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. That's God's will for all of humanity. But we acknowledge that not everyone is saved. And the reason why is that because of free will. Um, 
people have have to respond to God's predestination. They have to respond to God's election. They have to say yes. Uh, when the angel Gabriel appeared to the Virgin Mary, Mary was elected. Mary was predestined, but Mary still had to say yes. Behold, the handmaid of the Lord be done unto me according to thy word before the angel left. Now, we all have, we believe we have free will, but free will has been wounded by original sin. And the wound is malice or excessive self-love. Uh, and that's the root cause of all our sin when we think about it. And one of the chief preachings of Christ was to reorder our love. And that's why we find in, in responding to questions or making statements like love, you know, what is the what is the highest commandment of the law? Love the Lord your God with all your mind, body, heart, and soul. Love your neighbors yourself. So there's Christ uh, exhorting us to be, to freely love. Um, now, how do we overcome this wound of malice, excessive self-love? It's only by the grace of God. Who is act, what we say in Catholic theology, actual grace. He enlightens our intellects, moves our will, strengthens our will. Without that grace of God, prevenient grace, we won't be able to overcome malice, so to speak. And an example in scripture where it's a clear case where, you know, God has a will for someone or a group of people and they re re reject that will. We, we see it in, in Luke 7. 29 to 30. And I'll just read a bit here. You know, whereas the Pharisees and lawyers, by refusing it, that is John's baptism, had frustrated God's plan for them. So God had a plan for the Pharisees and the scribes. He loves them. He, he, he wishes them to be saved. Uh, and he gave them the opportunity to know the truth through John's baptism and Christ's preaching. They freely chose to resist that. And in resisting that, resisted God's will for them. So I, I certainly can't subscribe to the view that um, God predestines people to reprobation. Uh, a loving father creates and creates all of us as his children and wills, like any good father, will will them to salvation, will them to, uh, uh, you know, guide them or will them to eternal bliss, eternal happiness. And if... Many don't achieve that, and that's what Christ teaches. You know, the road to damnation is broad. Many walk on it, and it's easy to walk on. They're frightening words when we think about it. It's because of their individual choices to rejecting God's will for them. Right. Thank you. Uh, Michael, did you want to say anything on this point? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I'm probably uh, barking slightly up the wrong tree, but... Um... Uh, look, I think the, the, the whole issue of will is quite a fascinating one. Um, uh, in a sense, I think mm -hmm. it, it's important to distinguish a few different realms. I mean, one of them is, is the temporal versus the atemporal. So what we experience, I think, as, as divine will is, is the way that uh, reality plays out in time. Uh, but this idea then that, uh, that uh, um, uh, you know, that God is bound by the time wills in the same way that we as humans will is probably a, a slight uh, anthropomorphism um, now the anthropomorphic language is all the way through the holy scriptures and so therefore it's not something to be rejected um uh but it, it's also it, it still is important to make that uh, that distinction um uh the uh, another thing to uh, consider as well on, on the issue of will i think is that you know what what do we mean exactly by will you know i could will to want to become a pterodactyl uh, but unfortunately, uh, that's uh, not possible. Although in the 21st century, maybe I could identify as a pterodactyl. But uh, um, uh, now, in, in other words, my my will uh, is not is not without its limits. So really, the question then becomes: is what is the proper uh, will of the human person? The the, uh, the healed uh, will of the human person, and the healed will of the human person is to do the will of God. Um, so within our fallen, uh, within 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 the limitations we have of this uh, uh, daily life, what we will is in fact to overcome the great existential um, dimensions of, of of our existence. And uh, there there are, there are there are you know three great ones: uh, the fact that we are born; we don't have a choice in the fact that we're born; the fact that we uh, have sinned. And uh, no one can escape uh, that, that, that sinfulness, uh, as we read in the Holy Scriptures. 
And the second, and the, the last one, which really preoccupies our culture, is the fact that we're going to die. And all of those things, the exercise of our will is often, I think, really about us trying to get around this existential angst to do with those three, um, uh, three, three things. Now, uh, the, 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 the salvation in Christ is the fulfillment of, of our true will in the sense that what it offers us is rebirth and baptism. Uh, it offers us the forgiveness of our sins and offers us eternal life. And so, um, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. In, in terms of, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, in, in other words, we just need to think about what will actually is and what it's for. Uh, and uh, then I think things play out a little bit more. Now, in terms of um, uh, the issue of predestination, uh, once again, I think it's, uh, uh, it's really thinking in temporal terms about something which is atemporal, you know, uh, for, for, from God's perspective, uh, if I can dare to say, so I think that the, the equation of time is, is out of the question. And so therefore, in terms of knowing what's going to happen uh, or planning for something to happen in the future is not the way that we think of it. It's a different uh, type of mechanism uh, from a divine perspective, uh, I, I, would, uh, I would argue. Um, and so, yeah, and so it's difficult then to, um, uh, 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 yeah. So, 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 in other words, the, the, the scriptural language of predestination is a uh, human view of something which is outside of the human realm. Sure. All right. Great. Thanks for that. Um, we'll turn now to the questions that people have submitted. So, George is uh, asking about. Uh, the various perspectives on repentance, penitence, and their necessity for salvation. So are they required as well as faith and works? Um, and then there's a follow-up question after that. So uh, I'll just, uh, again, I'll just throw it to you, gentlemen, uh, who would like to respond on that one. Is, yes. is, yeah, is repentance and penitence, sorry, go ahead, Michael. <laughs> Yes. They, are, they are necessary. I think he wants a little bit more <laughs> detail than that, probably. Why? <laughs> um, uh, the the um, uh, work of repentance is part and parcel of us being uh, co-workers with God in, in, in the formation of our own, or the, in the rectification of our own fallenness. Um, now, one of the fascinating things, of course, is that uh, uh, you know, if you look at the Psalms, for example, obviously it's, it's filled with, with language of, of repentance. Um, uh, the early church obviously viewed uh, the issue of repentance quite seriously. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, from, from a sacramental perspective, if you want to uh, talk about it like that, you know, we have it very good uh, because as, as the church's um, uh, pastoral dimension has, uh, pastoral sensitivity has increased, then... Um, the strictness with which the church administers repentance has, has eased um, you know, back in, back in uh, like Shepherd of Hamas days, uh, once you were baptized, if, if you stuffed up once, then you had one chance very reluctantly to, to, to repent. And then after that, forget it. Um, Gosh, <laughs> that yeah. sounds very scary. Yes. Um, yeah. Okay. Um, so, <sighs> Can I then sort of, can I just sort of add a little bit to it and, and ask John, um, is is that repentance then, you know, is that something the human being chooses to do? Or is that also purely the grace? I mean, Michael talked about the cooperation mm. uh, between the human being and God in sort of in the act of repentance. Um, is, is that the same uh, sort of for in your tradition or is it all the grace of God that leads to the repentance? Yeah, so thanks for the question. I think I used the word cooperation a few minutes ago as well. Um, Excellent. <laughs> so I think the differences are going to be, di di uh, are going to be yeah. subtle. I think there probably are differences. So in terms of grace, uh, I'd be happy to characterise the reform tradition as monogistic that is it's god's work but it's god's work that then enables human work so there's a necessary human work in salvation 
I, I mean, not talking in terms of meritorious works, but a, a necessary response. Um, so in, in repentance specifically, that sort of, you know, that sense of feeling sorry about our sins right. and so, so on. Yeah. So both faith and repentance are human responses to what God has done. Um, and the Lord Jesus himself begins his ministry by saying, repent and believe the gospel. So that's always been the Christian message, and they're imperatives. It's calling people to do things. Um, and and I don't, the way that works is not for people to sit back and say, oh, I wonder whether God's done anything in me yet that enables me to do it. Uh, if God has worked in you, you will discover you're enabled. And, and when you, as you hear the gospel, you'll respond in that way. Uh, so in the kind of pastoral reality, it's going to, it, it, it's telling, it's calling on people to respond and praying that God will enable them to do that. Great. Uh, Robert, what's your view on yeah, well, all of this? That is, that's, I was going to actually quote the same beginning point. Christ begins his ministry with repent and believe in the gospel. And sadly today, um, I see many, even within the Catholic church, who, who don't emphasize the need for repentance. Uh, come as you are, you know, they talk about inclusivity without repentance. Well, in Jesus from the beginning made it clear that inclusivity is dependent on the repentance and repentance. Uh, you guys, you gentlemen, obviously know Greek better than I do, but the word originally is metanoia, which means change of mind. So Christ does the calling. Okay, the, uh, that's the grace. Without that, we can't repent. We respond to that. We have to respond to that freely. Um, so for me, John used the term monogism, and and I'm, I'm I have to admit that I, I believe in synergism, and I struggle though to see so, what sorry, difference sorry, John I'll, and I'll, I have. Because I'll just John, jump in. Just yeah. those two words. They they yeah. roughly mean monogism would mean just one person working, which yeah. is God, I yeah. assume, and then synergism means a working together. Yeah. So that's sort of God working yeah. with man or with the human being. Sorry, and, I just thought I'd clarify those terms. Yeah, yeah sorry. I, I'm very happy to agree with John about, you know, the need for human cooperation and, and response to the call, to the grace. We're enlightened. We come to a realization that we are sinners, that we are fallen, that we need to change and we need to change our mind and we need to change our lives. And that's a working with God's grace. And, but then I just want to make one comment about the word penitence in the question from George. Penitence is very controversial, and it goes back to the root cause of the Reformation, et cetera, et cetera. And, but um, we see it in Zacchaeus. When he converts, he doesn't just believe in Jesus and, you know, and wants to now follow Jesus, but he wants to follow Jesus by uh, undoing the damage he caused as a thief when he was as a tax collector. So he makes it clear that he's going to give away a half of his ill-gotten gains to the poor and then repay others four times the amount that he stole. So, you know, he's following the law of Moses there, but Christ actually commends him on that and, and says that this man is also a child of Abraham and salvation has come to his house. So in the Catholic tradition, this type of penitence is necessary for authentic repentance in the sense that you, you repent, you change your mind, you change your life, and you also then undo, to what extent you can possibly, of course, within reason, undo the damage you've caused by your sin. So it's, do we say it's necessary for salvation? Well, the repentance is what puts you back into God's grace, into friendship, into sonship, etc. Uh, and there is a requirement to repay ill-gotten gains, for example. Uh, now I'm heading into dangerous territory, and I don't want to expand this into other doctrines <laughs> relating to temple punishment, purgatory, all that. We'll leave that aside. Uh, but this is, um, we see it there in the, in the story of Zacchaeus's conversion. Uh, penitence, a uh, linked immediately with repentance. Lovely. Uh, okay, uh, George, uh, there's a follow-up question, but it, I think 
I don't know if Zoom cut you off. I, I, I hit enter too, too early, Abuna. Maybe <laughs> you, you, um, you want to ask Michael's one for now, because I'm not sure if we've got time for two from me. It's too selfish. All right. Oh, that, that's very Christian of you. You must be a Christian, apparently. Um, all righty. So, yeah, Michael's asking, and I think we've kind of touched on this already, and I think this is a question about what John was saying earlier. Uh, the question is, why wouldn't all humans be chosen by God? Uh, so, John, I don't know if you'd like to say anything further on that point. I mean, I guess my, inst my instinct is to say, no, I don't want to because I can't. <laughs> I, um, this is the mystery of God's, the mystery of election. Uh, and uh, Robert quoted earlier, um, you know, the text which talks about God wants all to be saved. And I think we need to affirm that as well, which just underlines the mystery it seems uh that god i, mean, I know the other I mean, robert's answer is not this robert's answer is the answer that why some people are not saved is because they because they choose not to respond uh but i want to go a level deeper and say uh we're only enabled to respond as god gives us the grace to do that and so there is a mystery about why god doesn't give that grace to all Right. Uh, and that's holy ground. Uh, we need, to, yeah, that's not something to speculate upon. Well, sure. I've got a question for, for, for John, actually. <laughs> um, so if, if that's the case, uh, what about the kind of the theology of, of image and likeness uh, in terms of uh, creation from, from a reform perspective as a, uh, as a, as a, as a seed of grace throughout the whole of uh, humanity. And actually, someone sent me a private message with a question on the image of Christ. So that's great that you asked that, uh, Michael. Yes, sorry, please go ahead, <laughs> John. Yeah, so, so I'd certainly want to affirm that all humans are made in God's image. Uh, but, but again, I think this is probably starting to tease out a little bit of where some of the differences are. Um, I, so I wouldn't want to talk about grace in creation not that i'm wanting to deny no i'm certainly not saying that creation is necessary or deny that creation is the um generous act of god which is not he's not constrained to create uh but certainly in the reform tradition we've we've tended to use the word grace for god's undeserved mercy to people who deserve his judgment to sinners under condemnation to say there's a big difference between being created and then being fallen. And the economy in which God treats creation apart from the fall is, is significantly different to the way in which God deals with the fallen creation and with fallen creatures. Um, so, so I think that it's thinking, it, it, I think there's a different way of conceiving things around that and the relationship between creation fall and redemption in the reform tradition that I, I think that there's a difference there at least it might take a long time to tease out exactly what that is uh and a long time unfortunately is what we don't have because we're drawing very close to our finishing time uh can i just we've got a couple of minutes left can can i just finally ask each of our three panelists to maybe just in 30 seconds or so <laughs> an impossible task uh respond to this question um how different do you feel your tradition is to the other two traditions um that that were represented tonight um i, I don't know if you'd want to put a number on it you don't have to put a number on it but maybe at least like you know do you feel it is importantly different or do you feel that the similarities are so overpowering that the differences are trivial Mm -hmm. All right, Antonis, thank you for the question. Um, as, as a Catholic, I feel very, very close to the Orthodox tradition, and I'm always pleased to you know, hear references to Scripture and also to the Church Fathers. Um, I did my first research project on St. Justin Martyr from the second century, and he used the term illumination with respect to baptism as well. Um, I think, you know, 
and it's been lovely being here tonight and it's been lovely sharing everything with Michael and John and our audience and of course Father Antonio thank you for the invitation I I do have you know I think the differences in many cases are small but in some cases significant the concept of double predestinations against uh, single predestination the the differences with respect to the impact of original sin, wounded or depraved. I think these have consequences that play out. Um, when, with the, you know, when we talk about bonded will or wounded will, these do affect you know, a lot of aspects of, of theology. Um, I, I certainly, <clears throat> I certainly uh, love to dialogue about these things. Uh, and and I, I dialogue because I think they are important questions. I think we're all people here of good faith, we're all people here of, who love God, who love Jesus Christ, who uh, want to obey him, who believe in the scriptures, who believe in the commandments, who want to do good, avoid evil. Oh, there's no doubt about that. Sincerity, as John said, might not be the test of truth, but it does play a role in, in our judgment before God. Um, so I think there's, there are some serious, for me, serious differences with the reformed tradition yes as against the catholic tradition and it's not just in the areas we discuss tonight but in so many other areas and i know many passionate people in the reformed tradition who who see the differences with catholicism also with great concern right thank you for that um uh michael would you like to go next <clears throat> Yeah, uh, well, uh, it's been wonderful. Uh, I was just here for the free pizza, but it hasn't arrived. <laughs> That's all right. Um, uh, look, it's really wonderful to hear from both uh, Robert and John, um, uh, their perspectives. Um, I think one thing that it does highlight, uh, which I think is very important, is that often we speak about uh, others as caricatures. Uh, and this has, uh, you know, historically been the case in many of the great uh, uh, theological um debates in, in late antiquity down to down to the modern period um i think that um uh look there there is very very broadly an agreement and i would argue that um uh, uh you know the uh, uh the, the 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 differences are uh nowhere near as significant as my own sinfulness and my need for repentance uh, so i'm not going to be um uh, critical of of a slight uh, different nuances. Uh, orthodoxy, I think, uh, and in particular, you know, non-Chalcedonian orthodoxy is, uh, you know, very much the forgotten uh, part of, of uh, Christianity. Um, uh, you know, so, so often when these discussions happen, they happen uh, from a Western to Western perspective. And then there's kind of the East stands on the side and says, oh, we're over here as well. Um, uh, so it's, it's, it's wonderful to be able to, to bring everyone into a dialogue. Look, I think that, uh, you know, generally speaking, that the differences are quite, quite small. Um, I think, you know, we, we can't do this in one and a half hours. Obviously, it would be great to sit down maybe for one and a half years uh, together and uh, really unfold uh, these uh, small differences and see where they lead. I think um, the thing I'm interested in is kind of, uh, I guess, uh, uh, the uh, chaotic mathematics of the whole thing. So, if you make a slight difference in initial conditions, where does that where, where, where does that lead to further on? I think that probably we would find some juicier stuff if we were to do that. But um, uh, generally speaking, I think um, you know we were all starting from it from a from a very beautiful place. Thanks, Michael. And the pizza's in the mail. <laughs> and John, uh, the last word falls to you. Yeah, I think I'm going to largely agree. I mean, it's not really obvious we do have a lot, a great deal in common. And uh, I mean, uh, lots of, but especially that we're starting with Trinitarian faith, uh, that we're affirming the scriptures. And therefore, you know, even as you know, the Reformed Protestant, I want to say, you know, we're, in, we're affirming the tradition, the great tradition of the church. Um, but there are significant differences. And I think that idea of the kind of uh, small changes can sometimes play out in significant differences in kind of ethos and spirituality and pastoral approaches and maybe apologetics and things like that. Um, so sometimes the differences can look bigger 
as we see them play out. But when you trace them back, yeah, the, the, they, they may be far more subtle to, to explain at a foundational level. Um, uh, but I mean, what's been good about tonight is we haven't been trying to play lowest common denominator. Let's just find the stuff we agree on and ignore everything else. Uh, I, I think that's the least useful form of ecumenical dialogue. It's far better to say, find the things we agree on and then also acknowledge the real differences and, and try and understand them um, in a genuine, friendly, compassionate kind of way. So yeah. thanks for setting it up. It's been, been fun. Oh, look, thank you all uh, for joining us, both our panellists and everyone else who joined us. Um, I, I totally agree. I, I think the the real, the new knowledge and new wisdom often does come from exploring the differences rather than the similarities. And yep. one thing that impressed me tonight is how often each of our panelists quoted something from someone else from the other from the other panelists, which is a sure indication that they were actually listening to each other. Um, which I commend you for, all three of you, gentlemen, uh, because I think sometimes in these discussions, people just have the thing that they want to say and, and they sort of steamroller it through. Whereas this, I think, was a real genuine discussion. You know, you're actually listening and, and taking seriously what each person said. Um, there's a couple of late questions there, but unfortunately, we won't have time for them. We might have to think about uh, possibly doing something like this again one day. Uh, but thank you so much to our panelists. We really, really appreciate your coming to join us today. Um, uh, thankfully, it is a public holiday tomorrow. Yeah. I hope you all have some time off and uh, we'll be able to sleep in a little bit after this late yeah. night that you've had. <laughs> That's worked out very well. And, and uh, we thank Her Royal Majesty and, and uh, <laughs> pray for her soul. Um, thank you, everyone who attended today Thanks also. Thank you, Warner. Okay. Thanks for your questions. Um, Ro Robert, can we ask you to please close with a very brief prayer for us so before we finish up? Thank you. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for this gathering tonight. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to share our views, our theological opinions and doctrines in the spirit of charity, in the spirit of faith, hope and love. And we pray that uh, we will always be faithful to you in the in the deep in the depths of our hearts, and that we continue to serve thee, Lord God, through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen.